This is actually happening features real experiences that often include traumatic events. Please consult the show notes for specific content warnings on each episode and for more information about support services. I put on this mask, this identity, and I adopted this because I did not know how to be my true authentic self and just be who I am. And I had to conform into this image of being a gangster. I made that decision. I got to let go. I got to take off this mask and stop lying to myself and just learn how to be me. From Wondery, I'm Whit Misseldine. You are listening to This Is Actually Happening. Episode 331. What if you killed the wrong person? My maternal grandparents, my family origin is Vietnamese. My family grew up in central Vietnam, in the city of Hue. My grandparents, they ended up having six children. My mother, who is the oldest, is named Hong Ha Nguyen, and they had five boys. What my parents and my family told me, it was happy living in Vietnam until the war my grandfather, Khoi Nguyen, he was a master sergeant for the South Vietnam. My mom's first job was working for the U.S. Air Force Base as a security police for the investigation section, which was located in Dainan. So she was supporting my family. And in 1968, during the Vietnamese New Year's, What's been a tradition in Vietnam is they will close the businesses and a lot of family members who work at different cities, they would come home to visit. And my mom did come home during 1968 to visit her family. For New Year's, there's supposed to be a truce between the North and South. But my mom tells me that that night the communists came in and invaded the village and all the cities throughout Vietnam during the night. It was a threat offensive. That night, 6,000 people were killed, families were torn apart, and there was a lot of gunshots, a lot of bombings. And my mom told her dad to get her siblings, get her mom, and leave. And my mom was crying. She was crying, she was crying. She was telling her dad, come with us, but he kept on persisting, no. And that was the last time my mom saw her dad. My mom ended up taking her five siblings and her mom and they escaped the village and they made their way back to Dainan. Dainan is a coastal village which is heavily armed with U.S. military forces. So my mom worked at the U.S. Air Base from 67 to 1969 and after that she got a new job to work at the U.S. Consulate. From 1969 to 1975 because she was working at the U.S. consulate. At the fall of Vietnam, April 30th, 1975, my mom, she was able to secure a safe passage for my family. They were one of the first families to escape. She was 21 and she had to carry the weight of just being responsible and taking care of her siblings. My mom and her siblings got sponsored to go to Philadelphia by the Lutheran Church. During that time in Philadelphia, my mom's friend introduced my mom to my dad. So they dated, they courted, they went around traveling the United States, just exploring. They traveled to Houston, Texas. They enjoyed it. They met a good Vietnamese community. And after seven years of being together, they gave birth to me in 1983. 
So my family and I eventually moved to Santa Ana, California, which is located in Orange County. It was a good time. My parents showed me a lot of love, but it eventually got hard because around that time, I, I didn't see my dad anymore and I would miss him. I was curious of where he was. I asked my mom, where's dad? When is he gonna come home? And at first, I remember hearing my mom just saying that, oh, he's at work. But as time went by, when I asked my mom where he was, she got irritated. Eventually, I sensed this, the sadness. So I stopped asking about my dad. I stopped thinking about him. With my dad being gone, I felt alone. I felt lonely. I missed him. I didn't know why he wasn't home. And I always had that sense of wanting him, like needed him in my life to teach me these things. For the most part, my mom, she was sad, but she held it together to support me. She had to work. We were on welfare. There would be sometimes we didn't have anything to eat. So what I would do is I would hang out on the streets. That's where I met my friend Mino when I was like about five, six years old. He lived right next door to me. And I remember spending a lot of days outside just playing hide and seek, tag, you know, exploring the neighborhood, playing with the insects, learning how to roller skate. We were just two kids just running the streets together. And because I was the only child, when I made friends with Mino, I really felt like this is my brother. And that helped me to not think about my dad. There was this show, America's Most Wanted and Cops, and they would have like these special episodes about gangs. And it was something that really caught my attention. And I would see gang members around my neighborhood and even meeting them as a child, going to the arcade. I saw them as being these cool guys, like these people that nobody messes with. These gang members would smoke cigarettes and they would ride these BMX bikes and give me money, give me food, and just treat me like a little brother. And I was young. This time I was probably like eight years old. And I really appreciate that. I was just wanting to do anything to be the cool kid, the one that everybody liked. I needed that sense of belonging. They would teach me things as well. They were teaching me how to steal. And by the time I was 10 years old, they introduced me to um, methamphetamine. This is around 1993. I smoked weed at the first time, drank some alcohol. I remember even being in a stolen car. I enjoyed that thrill of it. It was so exciting at that time. I didn't have like a male role model in my household that taught me how to grow up and be a man. My mom was there for me. She loved me, but I didn't feel it at that time. I needed something more. And I started seeing my friends as my family. And I would do anything for my street family. I really enjoyed that life. Like I wanted to be that gangster. So I started committing a lot of crimes. At this time, I was um, 13 years old in junior high. It was the last day of school. And me and probably like five, six of my friends, we went to play basketball. And after we played basketball, we were just walking down the street like where my friend lived. And there was a house, and they had a basketball hoop in front of their house, and we started shooting basketball, but nobody came out. And um, I had this idea. So I asked my friends, hey, you want to break in? They said, like, yeah, let's do it. We ended up stealing the cordless phone. My friend took a boom box, and we might have got some CDs. This was the first time I broke into someone's house and stolen their property. I felt like I was really cool. I got something. But also, there was that, that sense of fear that I was going to get caught. 
few months has gone by and nothing happened. And now I'm in eighth grade and we get called into principal's office and the police officer asks, oh, you know what happened? And me and my two friends, we came up with a story that, oh yeah, we were there playing basketball and we heard a noise in the back. So we went back there to see what it was. The police officer didn't believe us and they took us into custody. I was charged for residential burglary. They just booked us and they gave us a citation. Life was over here was tough for my mom. So my mom made the decision to leave California and go back to Houston. So we moved back to Houston, Texas. And one day my mom gets a letter. It says that I was subpoena for this residential burglary. And it says that I need to appear in court in California. At this moment, it had been like 10 years since I seen my dad. And somehow, like my mom reaches out to my dad and that he needed to take care of me because I have no other family members in California. And now I have a court case. So my dad agreed to basically let me live with him. And we ended up living in this house where we just rented one room and we shared. When I first reconnected with my dad, I had a lot of mixed feelings. At that time, my dad was diagnosed with diabetes. He was going blind. His leg was swelling up. He was in a bad shape. It was difficult for me to see him in this condition. And I didn't know how to process it. I still had a lot of resentment, a lot of bitterness towards him. So I would do the bare minimum as a son. But my dad let me use his car. I used to drive him to go get dialysis twice a week. Having my own car, I was just out all day. I was still hanging around my friends. I had a girlfriend at that time. So yeah, at that time I thought I was really cool and popular. During the final hearing, I was uh, found guilty and I was sentenced to six months in juvenile hall. My dad, he spoke some English, but he didn't understand the judicial procedure or anything like that. So they took me, they handcuffed me, they put me in an the elevator, they transferred me downstairs where it was the detention center. The Vietnamese translator told my dad what was going on. And my dad pleaded with the judge that the judge would reduce my sentence due to me being his caretaker. And the judge agreed. He resentenced me to 25 days of work program and one year of probation. My dad really saved me. But still, I wasn't happy or forgiving that he did that for me. I still did my bare minimum of taking care of him. So the beginning of October, and this was in 1999, I remember I came home from school. I was in uh, 10th grade and I was on the basketball team. And I remember I was getting ready. I was about to leave the house. And my dad, he pulls me to the side. He says, I'm going to take a vacation to Vietnam. I say, so how long are you going to be gone for? He's like, I'm going to be gone for two weeks. I said, okay, have fun. I'll be all right. And he said, okay, I'll be home in two weeks. At that moment, I walked outside and I stopped. Like I had this gut feeling, like the intuition where this may be the last time I ever see my dad. Like it's just some type of uneasiness inside. But I chose not to say anything. I chose not to go back and convince him. And I just left, I just brushed it off. A few weeks goes by on October 31st, 1999. I remember I was out Halloween going to parties, house parties, and I come home and the phone rings. I said, hello? My dad, he was married before meeting my mom. And he has other children. And my half-sister is crying. She's sobbing. And I asked her, what's wrong? And she just bursts out, dad is dead. I didn't know how to respond. And I just remember just closing my eyes. I really felt numb at that time. I didn't know how to process this. This is the first time that anyone in my life had passed away. And to receive that news was so shocking. 
Like I just didn't know what to do. What I told myself growing up is just shake things out and just keep moving and just suppress my emotions. But I felt the most alone, so much regret. After 10 years, I finally reconnect with my father. And that whole year, I never asked him any question about who he is, what type of person, what has he been through. It killed me inside. I didn't know what to do. I resorted to the streets. I was by myself. This time, I was 16 years old, living in Garden Grove, and I was still on probation. My probation officer had a conversation with me. He asked me if I needed anything, and I told him, no, I'm okay. That was my response to everything. I'm okay. When I got told that my father passed away, I called my, my girlfriend. Still, I didn't shed any tear or anything like that. But the next day, when I went to school, she just gives me the saddest face. She started crying. And me seeing her cry, it triggered so much emotion inside what I held that I started crying. And even my math teacher, he pulled me out of class. He said, are you okay? I shed some tears with him. I had these people that wanted to help me, but I completely shut down. I got more heavily involved with drugs. I wanted to numb the pain smoking weed every day, getting drunk, doing ecstasy, doing acid. Basically, any drugs that I could get my hands on, I was using. In those moments, when I was high, I wasn't thinking about anything. My sophomore year, I dropped out of high school, and I took my anger out on the world. My friend, Louis, his mom became my guardian for the last few months. So I moved in with my friend, Louis, and his mom. My mom was worried about me. She kept on telling me just to do good, finish your probation, and come home. Even when I was living with my friend Louis's family, I was still running the streets, doing whatever I wanted to do. You know, I was still hanging around with my friends who were gang members. Mino, childhood best friend, and Wall, he was my other friend. So us three, we grew up, lived next door to each other. Mino, he was the first one to join the gang. He joined a pretty big, predominant Asian gang and really was invested in this lifestyle. I was this gang member. I had a moniker and everything. So after my dad passed away, me, Mino, while we were hanging out every day, embodying the gangster mentality, just didn't care about anybody, getting to more fights. So I finished my parole condition and I ended up moving back with my mom. You know, I'm back in Houston, I'm okay, but the hurt has not gone away. And a few days after I left, my three friends called me while Mino and Lee, my girlfriend, they call me, they say, hey, can we come to Houston? I say, yeah, come over to Houston. They come, stay for a while, we're causing trouble over there. We started going around gang banging, causing problems with other people who we presumed that were gang members. We let them know who we were, and we're just hitting up everybody in the gang culture, asking them where they from, where are you from? For us, it was a show of we wanted to put fear into people and let them know you need to recognize us. Eventually, my friend Mino goes home, back to California. My girlfriend goes back to California as well, and Wal stays with me. And we're still causing trouble. One day on October 3rd of 2000, I get a phone call, and my friend Mino, he's all excited and everything like that. He's like, hey, happy birthday, bro. He asked me the question. He's like, is it okay if I can move over there? I, I want to leave California. I said, yeah. Four days later, I get a phone call from one of our mutual friends. She's crying. I asked her what's wrong. And she says, Mito got murdered. He's dead. 
like completely froze. It was like a dream, like all over nightmare from my dad getting that phone call to not even a year later. And I just spoke to him four days ago. It was such a big blow to my heart. Tell all what happens and you're just shocked, not knowing what to do. Throughout the days, we get more calls confirming his murder. There was a group of my homies. They were out at the shopping plaza and they run into the enemies. And there was like this melee that broke out. And what happened was uh, Mino gets stabbed one time in the heart. Mino was 18 years old. I was heartbroken. I didn't know how to cope or deal with any of this stuff. My mentality was F the world. Nobody cares. I didn't understand, like, why was this all happening to me? I went on a rampage. Me and my homies were mad at the world. So we took our anger, our vengeance, out on people. Any chance we got. Whenever we go to a club, I saw someone that I didn't like. I would bump into that person and would cause a fight. After a fight, wait for them in the parking lot had our guns, and was ready and had shootouts. After the loss of Mino, me and my homies needed and wanted to make a statement to show others that you cannot mess with us. So that's what we did. When I was getting into these fights, I felt like a release of so much hurt and pain. Like anytime I punch someone in the face, just being there when my homies pulled the trigger and was shooting at individuals, I felt like a rush. It didn't matter if I lived or died at that moment. I was willing to do whatever just to get revenge. So for the next year and a half, life was in a daze for me. Drinking more every day, wake up. Smoke weed, get high, pop Xanax, volumes, roam the streets looking for confrontation, looking for people that I can take my anger and my vengeance out on. Carrying my 380 Beretta in my car, just waiting, just looking for that opportunity to cause more hurt and pain. Lived in Houston, Texas at this time. It's about around May 2002. My former classmates are about to uh, graduate from high school. I had friends, you know, and I wanted to be there. So I fly over to California. And during this time, my mom, she blows up my phone. She's calling me, like, come home. She kept on warning me, come home. I said, yeah, 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 mom. So then on June 7th, my friends were out. I was at another friend's house. We are just in the backyard smoking weed, getting drunk, and high, just talking. I get this phone call from my childhood friend. He was in a coffee shop. He says, hey, the enemies are here, and they're telling me to come outside. I was about like 20, 30 of them. I said, okay. I said, you have a gun? He said, yeah, it's at my house. I tell my other friends, there's probably eight, nine of us. And I explain to them the situation was going on. The rival gang were the same gang that murdered Mino. So I had this deep hatred. I was like, this is the opportunity right here. So we drive off, we go get the gun. I give the gun to Joe, and he jumps back in his car. Now I call my friend and I tell him, oh, we're on our way. Just let us know where they at and um, we're gonna be there. We drive past the coffee shop, then we park into a neighborhood, I call Joe. At this point, he's driving around in the parking lot. He's like, I think I see them. He say, oh, they're in this kind of car. And at that moment, we see them drive by. So immediately, we jump in the car. I'm in the passenger seat, and we follow them down the street. So now, we're, we're behind them, and they make a quick left, they stop. My friend who was driving, he turns left as well. My other friend, Joe, he pulls into the street. At that moment, he jumps out. And I hear, boom, 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 boom. He gunshots. And then we pull back in. He jumps into our car. He says, I got him. I got him. And we drive off. Happened so fast. I would say no more than 20 seconds. 
the rush of my heart was pounding. It was a moment of relief. Like I felt like a protector. This will teach them. You killed my homeboy, now I got you. I called my friend who first had that altercation at the cop shop. I said, hey, you didn't hear nothing, you didn't see nothing. All right? So we just drive off. The next day, we read the newspaper. We found out that the person that we took his life was 14 years old. It was a mistaken identity. Realizing that was just so disappointing. This wasn't supposed to happen. <sighs> I brush it off to the side. Now I'm just like, we can't get caught. For the next year, I go back to Houston, Texas that I'm hiding. Eventually, my friend who originally had this altercation gets arrested. My friend who was driving gets arrested. And then eventually Joe gets arrested as well. And I remember that year, I was in a paranoid state. But that did not stop me from going to clubs, getting into fights. And eventually I get arrested. That day, Houston Police Department pulls me and three of my other friends over. The police officer comes back. I was in the front passenger seat. He pulls out the gun. He says, don't move. I'm going to shoot you. Handcuffs me. He sits me at the curb tells me you have a warrant in California for murder and I get booked into Harris County Jail July 12 2003 I still at that moment didn't realize the consequences and how deep I was involved I was coming down from drugs up until the point where I got arrested I was on PCP for a whole week my mom came visit me she was crying she was reassuring me that everything's going to be okay. I get transferred over to the authorities of the California detectives. We fly back to California. They put me in maximum security where it was 22 hours lockdown. And my mom was uh, stressed out, worried. She wanted to hire an attorney. But I told my mom, no, it was too much money. Don't worry about it. And inside, like I felt like I got myself in this, I'm gonna get myself out. One morning, I remember I see two cellmates come out of the cell to go downstairs to get their breakfast. And as they were walking by my cell, one of the guys, he slices his cellmate in the neck. And I see blood just gushing up. And then he runs back, he flushes his weapon. The guy that was bleeding, the deputies were telling him, come downstairs, come downstairs. So he goes downstairs, he's holding his neck, blood's running down. But in this whole process, he's just talking to his cellmate and saying, are we good? Are we good now? Is it okay? And I'm like, wow, you know, like he wanted to get his name cleared. At that moment, it got real for me. One thing about this county jail is it's segregated by race. The older inmates were teaching me. In here, you gotta stick to your own, you gotta protect your own, you gotta need to work out, you gotta be weight, you know. So that's what I started doing. I started eating, I started working out. I didn't want to be the victim. I was always on alert. You know, there would be tensions between the races. I really isolated myself into like this bubble. I became racist. And I stuck to my own. One day, I received uh, this letter that was written to me by my co-defendant. As I read it, he, he says, oh, I'm sorry about your girl, homie. Keep your head up. I was like, well, what does he mean? Before I got locked up, I was in a relationship. Her name is Jenny. And we've been together for three years. So I called home. I said, Mom, how is Jenny doing? My mom gives me the news. She said, yeah, son. She passed away. I knew you were going through a lot of stuff. I didn't want to tell you. And I was so shocked. You know, I was really hurt. My mom had kept this away from me for a whole year. And then I called some other friends. They told me, yeah, she hung herself. She committed suicide. 
she got pulled over for a traffic violation and she was booked into a Houston County Jail. The guards found her in her room. 2006, me and my co-defendant Joe goes to trial together. Our trial lasts about three weeks. Uh, still telling myself that I didn't do nothing. They don't have nothing on me. Still not wanting to accept any responsibility at all. And they come back with a verdict and the judge sends me 50 years to life. Two weeks later, they ship me out, get transferred to Kern Valley State Prison, the maximum security level four. As I hit the yard, I come in and I meet the other Asians and Pacific Islanders and they're like, oh yeah, you're never going home. Don't worry about the streets. During that time when I was at Kern Valley State Prison, all I cared was about chasing my next high, how to make money, you know, selling drugs, uh, selling tobacco, selling cell phones, um, and not showing any weakness. People were getting stabbed. It was not people were just getting beat up. It was actually sometimes, you know, they would get murdered. So as the years went by, I get transferred out of Kern Valley State Prison. And then I get transferred to level three security. I get transferred to Sentinel State Prison. There I was still in my ways of lying, manipulation, and being a selfish person. And I was fortunate enough to have people around me that were very level-headed. And one of the, we call them the older homies, the big homies, right? Steve had a conversation with me. He was very respected. He's been through a lot. He really cared and wanted the best for me. He encouraged me to start taking self-help groups. He was doing a lot of transformational work within himself and he invited me to this group. It's called Alternative to Violence Project. It's a three-day seminar group. I've never been to any of these groups before because uh, Steve encouraged me, I signed up, and he was a facilitator in this group. For the next three days, we had a lot of meaningful conversation. He was presenting things that I was never exposed to about myself and how I view others from just looking at people like objects, just the trauma, what I've been through. These seeds that were planted in me, for me, I walked away out of that workshop having a different perspective on people. So it was 2013, been in prison 10 years now. I get transferred to level two, lower security level. Saw that state prison, Monterey County. It's right next to Salinas. It's a big yard. The other prison yards that I was at they were divided by 200 people at most on the yard at a time. Here at this prison, there's 800, 900 people on the yard. The past 10 years, I was always confined behind concrete walls and we couldn't see the outside world. And I saw that prison was just a fence. I could see palm trees. I could see the 101 freeway. I can see the houses surrounding the prison and I was amazed. It was just a completely different environment what I was used to. Top of that, there was about a hundred Asian Pacific Islanders in this yard. So I was excited, you know, even though like I felt a lot of hopelessness and just a lot of disappointing throughout these 10 years. But, you know, I came here as something different, something changed. I remember doing a seminar and Mary Lou, the facilitator in this group, she says this comment that someone lied to you. Somebody lied to you. How I interpret that was when I was in the streets, my big homies told me like, those are your enemies. And that's how I saw them. But then when I entered the county jail, your homies, your bigger homies, the elders, in the joint would say like we're a family we had to protect each other so it shattered the gang cult thing 
we're at war with each other on the streets. But when we enter the system, the prisons, we're a family and we're hanging out together, we're eating together, we're living together. And that's the moment of realization of everything I've learned about the gang lifestyle is a lie. Once I realized that everything I believe about the gangs was a lie, I reflected on myself. I looked at my moniker, the image that I wanted to portray, someone that was down for the homies. And when I looked around, the people that were supposed to be close to me weren't there no more. From the street life to the gang life, it was like the people around you, they didn't really care. The people who really care about you will want to have your best interests at heart. It was my families and the people that were locked up, that were inside the prisons with me, who were the ones that were supporting me. It really shifted my outlook of who I am. I felt like I put on this mask, this identity, and I adopted this because I did not know how to be my true authentic self and just be who I am. And I had to conform into this image of being a gangster. I made that decision, I gotta let go, I gotta take off this mask and stop lying to myself and just learn how to be me. For so long, I lived with this name, the habits, the doing drugs, just being there for the homies. So it was really hard to transition out of that, to be able to just say no. And it was a lot of fear, not knowing would they still accept me. Because for so long, I just wanted to be accepted, just to felt belong, just to felt being loved. This image that I have carried for a long time is how I survived throughout my life, and especially in prison. To step out of that, here, am I gonna be able to survive? But I felt like a big sense of relief, like I had been carrying this heavy weight. For so long, I sat there with everything balled up inside of me, like I didn't want to say anything. If I said something, I'll be snitching and that's against the code and ethics. And I learned that whatever bad that happens in the family stays in the family. But it was draining. It drained me, it drained my soul. Now here, just being able to talk to people about my feelings, it was a sense of liberation. I started signing up into all groups. I am forever grateful for Kazu Haga. He's my mentor and he asked me, he said, would you like to tell a story that has some charge? I'm like, okay. So we're in this room, there's probably like 20 other men in there who, you know, I consider my brothers. We were practicing the principles of Dr. Martin Luther King nonviolence. And I shared a story of my childhood. So in the group, they had this cloth and they would put a cloth over my face and they would say something negative. And each participant did that. And after that process, I would tell my story again. But this time in reverse, they would lift each cloth and say something positive. And as I share what I went through, and as I hear these words of the brothers in the room, I just started to cry. It was probably my first time that I cried in a room full of men in my life. The words of encouragement, the love I felt, the sincerity, the empathy, I felt truly healed. I was able to move forward and be determined of never losing hope and just living that life of transformation. I became a facilitator. I became a mentor. I took on leadership positions because I felt the sense that this is how we can heal as a community. There's a saying that hurt people hurt people and heal people heals people. So I started to adopt that and I started to see the effects of my actions.
One day I was in my wing. I walk by the door and I see this name. And I'm like, man, I recognize this name. It's an Asian name. K, the person who murdered Mino. I thought to myself, I was like, can it really be him? The person who murdered Mino? So you know what? I'm just gonna go ask him. Approach him one day. I said, hey, you gotta feel me this. You know, I wanna ask you some things. So I just come out. I said, where'd you commit the case at? He tells me Orange County. And he describes the location. And he just confirmed everything. And I just told him, I said, hey, yeah, you know, that's my childhood friend. That's my homeboy. I just got up. Like, it was so much for me, right? Like, hearing the confirmation of him being the murderer who stabbed that knife into Mino's heart, I got up and left. Because I knew if I stayed there any longer, it would not be good. I go back into my cell that night. I'm laying on my bunk and, you know, I'm just looking at my whole life. I'm thinking about like, man, how did I get to this point? I was racking my brains, like telling myself at this moment, I need to do something. So when I laid there in bed, you know, I was still racking my brain of if I stab him, how do I get away with it? And in that process, I was just thinking the consequences, like how is it really gonna affect my family? My mom lost everything she had in Vietnam and wanted a better life for her family and wanted a better life for myself. And still I have caused her so much pain and heartache. I thought about if I did something to Kay, I would cause her more heartbreak and pain. And I wasn't willing to do that. And in addition, I was like, if I do it, it does not solve anything because all the things has already happened and I do not have the power to undo it. From Mino's death to taking an innocent life to the 50 year sentence, what does it really solve? All it will solve is just how my peers will look at me. For the first time in my life, I had to make a decision for myself to better myself. Even though it sounds like I am betraying my friends, I am being a coward and not being loyal, but I chose that. I firmly sat in that decision, like I need to forgive him. And so that's what I did. Being in a very tense environment, I knew I needed to let Kay know that everything is okay, that I'm not gonna do anything. As I approached Kay, you know, I felt a sense of nervousness uncertainty, not knowing what Kay's reaction would be. All I knew is regardless of his reaction, I need to, to express how I felt and let him know that I'm letting it go and that you're okay with the hope that he will receive it as an olive branch. He can trust me that I'm good for my word. I felt really rejuvenated like a deeper desire to be better, to grow, to just do the right thing. Like I've been selfish, I've been such a liar, deceitful, reckless, ruthless, all these things, right? I was such a horrible person. In this moment, it felt like I had the power that I can make a difference and that I can really change and do something that will honor the people that I have harmed. One day, I invited him to this class. It's called uh, Transcommunal Peacemaking Class. And it's all about reconciliation, nonviolence, social justice. I've been learning a lot about myself. I've been healing, attending seminars with Victim Impact where I'm listening to mothers of murdered children express the hurt, the pain they've gone through of losing their child and just sitting in that. And really now I came to the point where I'm owning up and I'm realizing how much damage I have caused. So we're in this class, me and Kay, you know, it was a unique class with university students, professors, and also incarcerated individuals. And during one of the sessions, he gets up, he makes an announcement and he apologizes to me. Sorry for taking Mino's life. I accepted his apology and it was one of the most healing moments that I had in my life. 
just the love, the support of everybody that was in that room that day, it brought back a, a deep sense of the love, the kindness within myself, the humanity. From there on, we started talking more. We would walk around the track and we would discuss about our lives and what we've been through and just share everything and we developed a friendship. Now when I'm able to express how I feel and just having that connection with Kay, like I felt like a whole again. So it's around uh, July of 2020. COVID has hit. The prison system has been getting closed down. There's no movement. I'm working in the medical infirmary and Kay, he's my coworker. At this point, our friendships has grown. We trust each other and we're able to work with each other. So COVID hits, they want to move all the workers who work in their infirmary into one building. So the correction officer tells me that I got to find somebody to move in with, that it's my coworker, or they're just going to put me with whoever's. Even though me and Kay developed and grown into friends, in my mind, I was still struggling. Like, can I really live in this six by nine cell with the person? But me and Kay both decided that, yeah, it would be a good idea for us to move in together. So I move in with Kay. Also in the process, I'm preparing to go back to court for another hearing. And Kay's like, wanted to share something with you. He goes, I want to share you what Mino's mom said at my sentencing. And I said, okay, yeah. So he goes through his paperwork and he pulls out the transcript. And I've been knowing Mino's mom since I was a little kid, five years old. And so she says that I know that Kay took my son's life and I don't want nothing bad to happen to him. I am requesting that justice be done. In a way, she forgives Kay. Her words really touched me and really inspired me to just do better and do no harm to others. And that's what I have been doing for these past 18, 19 years. I carry her words. On May 4th, 2022. It has been 19 years that I've been behind bars. I enter this courtroom, I'm shackled in chains, wearing an orange chef suit, and I haven't been in a courtroom since 2006. And I sit down. My attorney, who is amazing, she's been supporting me for the last 13 years. Just truly sees the goodness in me. I'm sitting there and the judge gives the opportunity to E's family. E is the person that I took his life. And E's family expresses the impact, how much they still suffer after all these years. I hear E's family saying that days of celebrations, of joyous memories of Things that normal folks should be happy about. Birthdays, graduations uh, are now ruined. As I sat there listening to words, like I understand how the hurt that I've caused, like it would never, ever go away. I sat there so, so regretful and sorry and just so responsible. Especially when E's family said, like, today, like, I have to celebrate E's birthday at the cemetery. Like, hearing those words, it is really hard. Also, it was a reminder for myself that I needed to do better. I need to find ways of making amends for all the harm and chaos I have caused. So the judge says, Chris, would you like to say anything? And I pictured this time for so long in the past. I sat in groups thinking of what I wanted to say to each family. Like I thought so much. And, and in that moment, 
I just apologize and say sorry. I understood there's no words or any actions I can do that can ever repair the harm, the hurt I have caused. Because there's no way of going back. All I could say was I'm sorry. And I sit back down and the judge was generous enough to have some type of mercy and resentence me to 15 years to life based on everything that I have accomplished while being incarcerated. It's proof and evidence of the growth of the person I have become. So now I've already been incarcerated for 19 years. What that meant for me being resentenced was I'm going to go to the parole board soon. I'm going to have my opportunity to be physically free. I get a notice that I will be going to the parole board January 24th of 2023. I walk in to the parole board. Commissioners just ask me everything from my life crime, from my involvement, to my past, to post-conviction, to my parole plan, to my relapse prevention. So I answer all these questions. I'm asking all these questions. And I'm nervous. I'm uncertain. But all I could do was just to be honest. And that's what I did. Any questions they asked me, I was just honest. Both commissioners found me suitable for parole. So I was granted parole. And then my counselor calls me up and tells me, you're going to be released on June 20th. And I can't believe it. I can't believe that I'm actually going home. I was such in a dazed state, in a shocked state. So many emotions going through my body. This is so much to take in. June 19th, 2023. I'm laying there, you know, thinking about all the excitement, what I'm going to do, how life is going to be. It's something that I, I have imagined for the past 20 years and never ever thought that I, I would be able to be released back into society. Never. And that day, as I laid there, June 19th, it's Mino's birthday. Here I am, my last day in prison. It's on his birthday. It was just so surreal. It's been a year since I've been released from prison. A year I've been free outside in society. And so much has happened. And how grateful I am. I've experienced so much from just going to the football games, the Raiders game, the Lakers game, and also being on the prices, right? Going all the way to the showcase showdown. Life have just been an incredible experience. Each day I wake up, I'm just so grateful for all the blessings I have received and just the relationships, the friendships, the people I have met, just coming to see my mom and being able to go visit her in Houston, like walking into the house and just going into my room, seeing my bed and seeing my uncles has been just such an incredible and loving experience. As I reflect and look back into my life, it's been an incredible journey. And today, I'm fortunate enough to continue to help folks into finding healing, into finding insights and purpose within themselves. And the work that I'm continuing to be involved with allows me to support people on their journeys of redemption, their journeys of finding freedoms within themselves, building that freedom cultures, and also transforming and earning their freedom to come back into society. Um, it has been so rewarding. And that's how I live my life every day. It's just to be grateful and count my blessings and just understanding that I do have a place in this world, but I also can impact people's life in a, such a positive way. I've come to realize that each person has that power to change their narrative of who they want to become and who they are. In the past, I wanted to be this gang member. And I lived it. I invested my time. But what I've learned 
on my journey is I do have the power. So does each and every one of us have that power to shift in any moment that if we want to change our narrative, if we want something more in life, we can do it. And it's just really up to us to make that decision to really sit inside ourselves and really think of what we want to be. Every single day, we have that power of a choice. And it's ultimately up to us. How do we use our power? How do we tell our story? How do we want to be remembered? What principles, what values? For me, I just want to love. Today's episode featured Chris Yip. If you'd like to reach out to him, you can email at chrisyip2023 at gmail.com. That's C-H-R-I-S-D-I-E-P-2023 at gmail.com. Or you can find him on LinkedIn as Christopher Yip. From Wondery, you're listening to This Is Actually Happening. If you love what we do, please rate and review the show. You can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, or on the Wondery app to listen ad-free and get access to the entire back catalog. In the episode notes, you'll find some links and offers from our sponsors. By supporting them, you help us bring you our show for free. I'm your host, Whit Misseldine. Today's episode was co-produced by me, Andrew Waits, and Aviva Lipkowitz, with special thanks to the This Is Actually Happening team, including Ellen Westberg. The intro music features the song Illibi by Tipper. You can join the community on the This Is Actually Happening discussion group on Facebook, or follow us on Instagram at Actually Happening. On the show's website, thisisactuallyhappening.com, you can find out more about the podcast, contact us with any questions, submit your own story, or visit the store, where you can find This Is Actually Happening designs on stickers, t-shirts, wall art, hoodies, and more. That's thisisactuallyhappening.com. And finally, if you'd like to become an ongoing supporter of what we do, go to patreon.com slash happening. Even 2 to $5 a month goes a long way to support our vision. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening.